like to go ahead and get started for uh, tonight's presentation, which is Vitamin K, the untold story of a vitamin superstar. Before we get started, just a quick background for me. Again, for those of you who are unfamiliar, I am Brian Sanderoff. I'm a traditionally trained pharmacist. I used to have my own pharmacies, actually two pharmacies in downtown Baltimore at one time. And after being in my pharmacies for about 10 years, I really started to question how well I was helping my patients. And what I came to realize was that when it comes to chronic diseases, the kinds of things that we are really trying to avoid or recover from as we get older, things like blood pressure, or diabetes, or cholesterol, or depression, or osteoporosis, or you know, hormonal issues like menopause, or even some cancers, what we do in medicine is not fix anything. All we do in medicine, especially with those prescription medicines that we give, is turn down the volume on what the body's saying. And so that sort of put me on a path to try to figure out a different way to understand health and to help people understand health. I have been known to say that the number one killer in this country is not heart disease. It is not cancer. The number one killer is misinformation. It's not understanding how the body works, and it's not understanding the ramifications of the decisions that we make. So that's a lot of work that I do. If you want more information about me and my philosophy about health, you can go right to the website, wellbeinggps.com. You'll see my picture there. If you click on it, that'll take you to a nice written uh, version of what my philosophy is about health. And I would encourage you to um, give me feedback. Let me know how we're doing in our mission to educate people. And don't hesitate to get in touch with me with questions or whatever. So tonight, we're talking about vitamin K. And as it says there, the untold story of a vitamin superstar. And I kind of say that tongue in cheek. I mean, I try not to get too excited and hype up things too much. But the truth is, is that every so often, what happens is information is here that we've been ignoring for a long time, and it's important information, and that's the case with vitamin K, because many people do not understand or fully grasp the ramifications of whole body health that vitamin K can play. And I'm not talking about just blood clotting, but of course, that's an important aspect of vitamin K, and that's really what people have come to recognize or know about vitamin K. So we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. And again, I encourage you to type your questions into the little question box as we're going through the presentation. So to start out, let's, let's talk about what vitamin K is. Well, first of all, it's not actually a vitamin. It's a whole group of vitamins. So sort of like estrogen really is a group of compounds that are in the body, in the human body. It's the same thing with vitamin K. It's really a group of vitamins that are structurally similar. Um, vitamin K was, quote unquote, discovered in the 1920s. And it, it was determined that a deficiency would lead to problems with clotting. And that's how the name vitamin K came to be. It was some German research, and so clotting was with a K. And so that's where vitamin K came from. I also want to point out that it's fat soluble. So just like vitamin A and D and E, you know, I remember one of the very early lectures in pharmacy school talked about nutrition and vitamins. And classically, we are taught that fat soluble means that the body will store those vitamins and that they can be toxic. And the potential for that exists, but as we'll find out a little bit later, vitamin K really it's not toxic when you get it in the right way. It can't, it can't be toxic. There's two natural forms of vitamin K. When I say natural, what I mean is there are two forms of vitamin K that exist in nature. They're called vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. And interestingly, researchers have not been able to determine a toxic dose of either of the two natural forms of vitamin K. And so that means that there's no tolerable upper limit. Can't really hurt yourself with it. There is a synthetic form of vitamin K, actually a few, although the one that you hear about most often is vitamin K3. It's called menadione. 
but there's also actually a K4 and a K5. Interestingly enough, these are synthetic. These are not the same chemicals that we would find in nature. And they can be toxic, both to liver and kidney. All right, so let's start off by talking about K1. So K1 is the plant form of vitamin K. You will find vitamin K1 in plants. It goes by a bunch of different names, all meaning the same thing. So is phyloquinone or phytomenadione or phyto, or phytonadione. Um, those all mean the same thing. And they're just talking about vitamin K1, which again is the, the plant form. They come from leafy green vegetables. So I'm talking about things like spinach and kale and collards or chard. Um, also, other things that are green will have vitamin K in it. So broccoli, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, cabbage. Vitamin K is involved in the process that we call phytos, uh, photosynthesis. And so what that means is that it really will be in at least small amounts in anything that's green. Um, whereas some vitamins are actually destroyed or altered by cooking or heating or freezing even, this is not the case with vitamin K. And sometimes just the opposite. Cooking may actually free or release some of the vitamin K and make it actually more available to you. So a cup of cooked spinach actually contains more vitamin K than a cup of raw spinach. Even though this is the plant form, or this is the form of vitamin K that's found in plants, it's actually active in animals. So vitamin K1 performs all of the classic functions that vitamin K will perform in the body, and we'll go over quite a few of those. So one way that animals, including us, can get our vitamin K is eating it in vegetable sources, and primarily from the leafy green vegetables. Um, interestingly, parsley is probably one of the richest sources of vitamin K. Of course, we don't eat the amounts of parsley that we would of a salad or you know, green leafies that we would find in a salad, we have a tendency to use parsley as a, uh, you know, as a, as an herb to flavor something as opposed to the base of a, of a meal. Okay. So then there's also vitamin K2. And K2, as you can guess, if K1 was the plant source, K2 is actually the animal source. And it is the main storage form of vitamin K in animals. Its name is called menaquinone. So you can eat certain animal products and that will be a source of vitamin K2 for you. Things like cheese or liver or egg yolk or butter. But vitamin K2 is available chemically in a couple of different versions. There are some variations. Um, and so a chemical distinction is made on, uh, based on the location on a number of certain chemicals or chemical groups that are attached to the main chain of the vitamin K. And so there's one that's called MK4, and that is called menetetronone as well. And so there are four of these other chemical groups attached to the main vitamin K. Um, and K4 is the vitamin that um, it's actually made from K1 in the body. And in the body, the areas where K1 is converted into this version of K2, which is called MK4, is in arterial walls, the pancreas, and the testes. And then there's also MK7, and so that has a different set of chemicals attached to it. And this is produced from vitamin K1, remember get the plant source, by bacteria. So this means is this can happen in fermented foods. If so, if you're eating uh, fermented soy and certain cheeses, then you're getting MK7, that specific form of vitamin K2. But this also can happen in your gut and specifically by bacillus bacteria. So this is why the probiotics or good bacteria in your stomach become important for other reasons as well. All right, so what are the functions of vitamin K? Well. First off, there's blood clotting, and that's the one that we most commonly associate with vitamin K, and that's the one that our doctors and medical researchers think of as vitamin K, is really, um, you know, about the clotting. Um, but vitamin K also has functions about appropriate 
calcium usage within the body. And I'm talking about in the bones and in the cardiovascular system. And I'm talking about that uh, in much more detail in a second. And then vitamin K has various other functions in the body, including um, fighting against oxi oxidative damage. It's not really thought to be an antioxidant like vitamin E would be or beta carotene, but it does help fight against oxidative damage through a couple of different mechanisms. It also seems to play a role with cutting down on inflammation. And if you guys are regulars, you know my thoughts about inflammation and how important it is to um, dampen the body's tendency towards inappropriate inflammation because truly the underpinning of practically every chronic disease, one of the underpinnings is inflammation. And then also plays an important role with brain and nerve function. Literally plays a role with the making of the myelin sheath, which is the, the coating that goes around nerve tissue that makes it be able to um, communicate with other nerve tissues appropriately. All right, now we're going to go into some of these um, functions in the body in a little bit more detail. So let's talk about blood clotting at first. And I put up this term, homeostasis, and it's really important to understand this concept. And you'll understand why I'm going into it in, in a bit of detail in a second. So number one, homeostasis is the term that stands for or means the process by which the body will do what it needs to do to maintain life. The body will adapt in different ways to be able to maintain life immediately. And when it comes to vitamin K and blood clotting, that blood clotting is homeostasis in action. Action, it's life preservation. Without the ability to clot blood, we would quickly, quickly, quickly die. Either from a simple cut, that we get on our skin that you know doesn't stop bleeding, or from bleeds that happen inside our bodies that we never even recognize that are there. And so our body's ability to clot is a homeostasis pro uh, process, a homeostatic process, and it's very, very important. So the mechanism, the mechanism of action that clotting ever hap actually happens involves vitamin K. And so there's a process that's called carboxylation. And in blood clotting, this process allows for the clotting factors to become sticky so that they can stick to nearby tissue surfaces so that the formation of a clot can happen the way it's supposed to. So without this process of carboxylation, clotting factors couldn't do their job. They couldn't you know, stop the stem the tide of, of, of bleeding. So vitamin K is responsible for helping this process. That process of carboxylation cannot happen without vitamin K. So it's interesting because vitamin K was discovered through scientific study of clotting, of blood clotting, back in the 20s, 1920s. But unfortunately, it has become defined by this process to the exclusion of all other processes or possible um, benefits that vitamin K has in the body. So in practical terms, this very important function has ended up actually defining vitamin K. And for the most part, that's how we measure vitamin K in the body, by clotting. And Unfortunately, this has ended up becoming a huge miscalculation or misunderstanding or, or sort of a short-sighted evaluation of the importance of vitamin K in the body. Because of the ability to clot is at the forefront of immediate life preservation, the last place that we will see a vitamin K deficiency in the body is with problems with this mechanism. So if vitamin K has a whole host of uses in the body, the, the, the one process that we're going to see get affected the last is blood clotting. So if we use someone's ability to clot blood as the measure of adequate vitamin K levels, we're making a big mistake. And that's actually what we do in medicine, unfortunately. So the other big purpose that vitamin K 
plays a role in in the body is the appropriate use of calcium. And I'm going to talk about it in two separate areas. So let's talk about the bones first. So there's a protein that's found in the bones that's called osteocalcin. It's secreted by the osteoblasts, and the osteoblasts are the bone builders. These are the little cells that help make new bone. And if that term is completely foreign to you, I would refer you to the webinar that I did, I don't know, I think about a year ago about osteoporosis, where I go into it in much more detail. And that's on the archives on our website that you can listen to. So this protein, osteocalcin, is secreted by the osteoblasts. And what it does is it supplies structure for the bone. So this is sort of like the framing in a house. This is what allows for the binding of calcium to the matrix of bone, which then makes bones stronger, more dense, more resilient, which is something that we're trying to fight against as we get older, right? Osteoporosis is the loss of bone mass and the loss of bone density. And so what osteocalcin does is it's like the framing of the house, and then calcium becomes like the wallboard. Well, as you can guess, osteocalcin needs to be carboxylated for it to work properly. This is the same process that happens in the blood clotting that we just talked about. But without adequate amounts of vitamin K, the body is hampered in its ability to make and keep strong bones. And it's interesting because vitamin K2, two of those forms, MK4 and MK7, have shown activity and benefit for helping to build bone. It's also interesting to note that there's an effect that osteocalcin has on osteoclasts. Osteoclasts are the cells that break down bone. So their job is to go around and find old brittle bone and get rid of it. Osteocalcin seems to play a role with controlling the number of osteoclasts and their ability to actually die when they're supposed to be. The, in, in the body, every cell is sort of programmed to die at a certain point. It's called programmed death. And so every cell has an internal program where it says it does a certain function for a period of time and then it dies off. And when cells forget to die off the way they're supposed to, problems can happen. If we have too many osteoclasts, then what happens is the breaking down of bone happens at a rate that's faster than the building of bone. And when that happens, then, we can, then our bones can become porous. So this osteocalcin plays a role with, one, keeping the number of osteoclasts appropriate, and two, helping them remember to die off when new ones are born, if that makes sense to you. So I want to talk about a couple studies in relation to vitamin K and its role in building bone in the body. So there's the nurse's health study and there's the Framingham study. So both of these studies showed that people with the highest dietary intake of vitamin K, which is K1 again, the plant source, had the lowest incidence of his hip fractures. Other studies, studies, studies sorry, using supplementation did not necessarily show the same results. And really that kind of illustrates that there's a lot of factors here. So if you supplement with a vitamin K1 and your body doesn't have the ability to convert that into a more active vitamin K2, you may not see the same results. And that's where keeping the bacteria in your gut is important, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, also, I want to talk about calcium in the blood vessels. There's another protein that's called matrix GLA. And this one is present in blood vessels. And it's at, literally in the vascular smooth muscle. So when you have a blood vessel, a, 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 a vein or um, an artery, it's actually made up of what's called smooth muscle. And within that smooth muscle is this protein called matrix GLA. Well, matrix GLA is a key inhibitor of soft tissue calcification. So what that means is it literally binds to calcium and prevents it 
from depositing into the vessel walls. Now, hopefully you guys are raising an eyebrow and saying, wait a second, you're talking about atherosclerosis. You're talking about clogging of the arteries. And yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So ultimately, if you can inhibit calcium from becoming uh, part of the blood vessel or depositing into the blood vessel, you can work to prevent clogging of the arteries and ultimately to prevent heart attacks. Here's the kicker. Again, matrix GLA needs to be carboxylated to work properly. And who's the player in the part in the carboxylation? Vitamin K. And it's interesting because MK7, that one specific version of vitamin K2, may play a bigger role here than the other ones. It's a well-established fact that people who are on blood thinners like Coumadin or Warfarin have twice the amount or of arterial calcification than people who are not. And what is Coumadin or Warfarin? It's a vitamin K antagonist. It stops vitamin K from being able to do its job. The reason we give it to people in medicine is because we're looking at vitamin K's role in clotting. We've determined that under certain conditions and with certain health conditions or challenges, we want somebody's ability to clot to be a little bit affected so that they don't clot as well. If someone has a condition where they get pooling of blood, say in their heart because a heart valve isn't working properly, or pooling of blood in the heart because they have a, um, a rhythm problem, then we would put them on a blood thinner so that their blood doesn't clot as easily so that we can prevent inappropriate clotting where that, pool is blood, uh, where that blood is pooling. So we give a medicine that interferes with vitamin K. But interestingly enough, people that take those medicines are twice as likely, they get twice the amount of calcification because they're stopping vitamin K from carboxylating matrix GLA to help prevent that from happening. Again, I want to go to a couple studies. So there's the Rotterham study. And there's a study done by Gast and his uh, um, colleagues. So what these studies showed that people that consumed the most K2 had a 50% reduced risk of arterial calcification. They also showed a 50% reduced risk for cardiovascular events, talking about heart attacks here. And Gast in his study showed that K2 intake was the one that seemed to protect against cardiovascular disease the best. And so we get K1 from plant sources, we get K2 from animal sources, or we can get it from supplemental sources, and we'll talk about that in a second. Hopefully all that makes sense to you guys, and it's, um, you're, you're getting this. No one's typed in any questions yet, so either everybody's asleep or uh, just doing an excellent job of explaining this so far. All right, so then the next question becomes, how do we measure deficiency? Well, the way we do it in medicine is by blood clotting times. If you went to your doctor and say, hey, I want to know if I have adequate amounts of vitamin K, they would do a test to see how quickly your blood clots. And that's how they would determine whether you had adequate amounts of vitamin K. But unfortunately, the only time that a doctor would do that test for you is if you were having some sort of issue. If you were having spontaneous nosebleeds or when you got a cut, it didn't, um, you know, it didn't heal properly. Or if you cut yourself shaving, um, you know, and it took an hour to you, for you to stop bleeding, that's when the doctor would say, wait a second, maybe there's a vitamin K problem here. And that's usually in medicine the only time we ever look for it. And it would be my contention to you right now that if somebody's walking around with osteoporosis, if someone's walking around with cardiovascular disease where they're getting, you know, uh, atherosclerosis, they're starting to get clogging. Those are indications of low vitamin K. And in medicine, we never consider that. That's what I mean when I say that vitamin K has become defined by its role in clotting to the exclusion of all the other roles in the body. And that, my friends, is a huge mistake because I believe that we could help alleviate a lot of suffering by getting more vitamin K in our diet or starting to supplement with vitamin K. So 
what could cause deficiencies? Well, number one, there's some dietary concerns. If you don't have enough green leafy vegetables in your diet, you're not getting vitamin K. Number two, how about if you're on a low fat diet? How long? This is one of those things that it's just one of my pet peeves. And again, it's what I mean when I say that misinformation is a main killer here because we have been told for the last 30 or 40 years that we should be on a low fat diet. And when you're on a low fat diet, you cannot absorb and make use of your fat soluble vitamins, including vitamin K, as efficiently. We should not be on a low fat diet. What we should be on is a controlled fat diet. That's what nature wanted for us, a balanced fat diet, not a low fat diet. Imbalances of the good bacteria in the gut play a major role because if we eat our green leafy vegetables and so we get K1, but we can't convert K1 into K2 because we don't have the proper bacteria instilled in our gut, then we can't get enough of the vitamin Ks that are important for the bones and important for the cardiovascular benefits. And then we can also have some parts dysfunction or we can have some parts removed. You know, I shake my head when I look at medicine and see how cavalier we are in determining that, you know, God gave us some parts, but we really don't need them or we can live without them easy enough. So I'm talking about, for the most part, your appendix and your gallbladder here. The function of the appendix in your body is to help re-inoculate your gut with good bacteria when there's an imbalance. The appendix is just a reservoir of bacteria. Now, we don't recognize that in medicine. And in fact, when I was in pharmacy school in the early 80s, we were taught that the appendix is an organ that evolution was making not needed anymore. And there are many, many people who have had the experience of having some sort of surgery. And while they were open, the doctor said, ah, I'm going to get rid of the appendix also because it's just going to cause a problem down the road. And obviously, that's a huge mistake. Um, gallbladder, same thing. Without your gallbladder, you have a harder time absorbing fat-soluble vitamins. You have a harder time breaking down fats from your diet so that you can absorb them and use them. And so one of the ramifications of having your gallbladder removed is exactly what we're talking about here. So how much is enough? How much vitamin K should we have? either in our diets or supplementally. Okay, so here's this concept. It's called adequate intake. Usually when we talk about vitamins, we'll talk about the RDA, recommended daily allowance, which is the amount of a nutrient that you need to avoid the deficiency of that nutrient. So the amount of vitamin D that you need to avoid getting rickets is the RDA. Well, for some nutrients, including vitamin K, what we have is actually called the adequate intake. And so in 2001, the Food and Nutrition Board of the Institute of Medicine established the adequate intake level based on the consumption levels of healthy individuals. But unfortunately, I don't know that we have properly defined that term healthy in regard to vitamin K because what are we looking at with vitamin K in medicine. All we're looking at is the body's ability to clot. And as I've pointed out, that's the last place you're gonna show a deficiency. So for adults, the AI, the adequate intake, is somewhere between 90 and 120 microgram, micrograms every day of vitamin K. But that's how much you need to make sure that you can clot blood. That does not speak to the appropriate use of calcium in the body. It does not speak to helping calcium get into the bone, and it does not speak to keeping calcium out of your blood vessels. So the typical therapeutic approach, because there's no upper tolerable limit, that means that it's safe to supplement with higher dosages of vitamin K, and there appears to be reasonable scientific evidence that taking much higher doses than the AI is actually warranted in helping to prevent and maybe reverse some of those things that we've been talking about, and in particular, osteoporosis and cardiovascular disease. 
So let's talk about a, a few strategies for getting enough vitamin K. So obviously, eat more green leafy vegetables. And again, I want to point out that cooking may actually make more of the vitamin K available. So talking about kale or chard or spinach, uh, greens, anything like that. If you cook it with a little fat, some olive oil, or what we do here is we use coconut oil, that fat actually enhances your body's ability to absorb the K that much more. You also can eat more fermented foods. And so I'm talking about cheeses, yogurt, um, soy foods, if that makes sense to you. You can also supplement with probiotics. And this is really, really important because many of us are walking around without enough good bacteria in our gut. And as a result, we end up not being able to convert the vitamin K1 that we may be getting from our plant sources into the K2, which is the more active form in the body. And I would refer you to one of my webinars, which is called The Essential Six, and it's recorded on the website for you to listen to. One of the essential six, which are the six supplements and or systems in the body that everybody needs to address to be healthy, to keep your genes expressing themselves in a positive way. One of them is probiotics, and this is one of the reasons why. Um, you can supplement with vitamin K. And I like to look for combination products. And so I'm talking about ones that supply both forms of vitamin K2 that are important, MK4 and MK7, for different functions in the body. And, and then sometimes even in combination with, MK, with uh, vitamin K1, which is, again, the plant source vitamin. So I have a couple favorites. Um, one of them is called vitamin D and K by Life Extension. The reason I like this is because another one of the essential six is vitamin D, and we don't get enough of it. And so this product combines a good dose of vitamin K, and again, mixed dose, vitamin MK4 and MK7, with 5,000 units of vitamin D, which I would take separately anyways. And it also includes some iodine, which is another one of these nutrients that we don't get enough of. And I've written a nice article about this on my uh, a website uh, so that you can come and understand why we need iodine so much more as well. So that's a great product. And then also probiotics by Healthy Origins. This is a very potent, multi-strain, shelf-stable probiotic formula. Each capsule gives you 30 billion bacteria guaranteed until time of expiration. Many probiotic products out there actually um, tell, tell you how many bacteria or how much bacteria is in it at time of manufacture. And by time it makes it from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to the retailer to you, oftentimes much of that bacteria has died off. So this one by, by Healthy Origins, shelf stable, doesn't need to be refrigerated, and it'll have 30 billion bacteria at time of expiration, which means a year and a half to two years down the road. It's a great product. It's very affordable. And this is a great way to start to change the dynamic of what's going on in your gut and how your body uses nutrition. All right, starting to get some questions, and now's a good time to type in questions if you have them, because um, we're getting close to the, the end of the presentation today. So uh, let's see, Linda's got some questions. So I'm a duodenal switch, that's gastric bypass based on malabsorption, no appendix, 13 years out of surgery, recently diagnosed with significant bone loss, vitamin D and vitamin K deficiency. Had trouble clotting last year, been eating lots of green leafies and virtually no dairy. So all of that makes perfect sense and not surprising that when you've missed, you're missing those parts of your body that, um, you know, that you're going to have a problem with those things. So due to onset of lactose intolerance from, you know, from that problem, does the intake of dairy enhance the um, absorption of vitamin K? Yes and no. You are a prime candidate to do this not through your diet, but through supplements to make sure that you're getting enough, Linda. And so that 
product, vitamin D and K by Life Extension, is a perfect one for you. You also should be taking a digestive enzyme when you eat. So that way your body will have a better chance of breaking down the fats in your diet and being able to absorb them along with your fat-soluble vitamins. Chances are, even though we don't usually measure these, that you also have a problem with the other fat-soluble vitamins, um, A and E, just because of the changes that have been made. And for you, I'm not a big fan of having dairy products. They're not really healthy for you. They're not good for you. And so you're like the perfect candidate to try to do this through supplements. Obviously, you should be eating green leafy vegetables. And taking the probiotic will make it so that you can convert more of that vitamin K1 that you're getting in those green leafies into K2. And as I said, you're a good candidate to make sure that you're taking probably a fairly aggressive dosage of vitamin K um, as a supplement as well. So, uh, Linda, thank you for those questions. I appreciate that. Uh, anyone else? Type anything in there and we'll uh, take a, um, a look at those also. So. Um, Getting to the end here, I just want to point out that there are some potential interaction concerns with using vitamin K supplementally. So number one, avoidance, and we talked about this earlier. If you're on a blood thinner like Coumadin, also known as Warfarin, you have to be careful with the vitamin K. Now, I'll tell you, because vitamin K, adding vitamin K to your system will somewhat counteract the effect of Coumadin. Now, again, when I graduated from pharmacy school, if someone was on Coumadin or Warfarin, we were told to tell them, don't eat any green leafy vegetables. And more recent research and um, experience has shown us that when someone that's on one of these blood thinners takes a consistent amount of vitamin K in their diet, meaning that they have a small salad every day, it actually helps maintain their blood levels and their clotting levels more consistently. A lot of people, especially as they age, have a hard time maintaining proper blood levels, meaning that every time they go to get their Coumadin level checked, their clotting time is different and they have to have the Coumadin dose adjusted. And what we found is that when people are consistently getting small amounts of vitamin K, it helps to maintain that level more consistently. Got a question coming in from Virginia here. Why is it important to take a probiotic with food? Is it okay not to? It depends on the probiotic. So that one that I mentioned with health, uh, by Healthy Origins, you can take that with or without food. It doesn't matter. The Sometimes we want to have someone take a probiotic about 20 minutes after they eat because some bacteria and some uh, products, the bacteria that are in those products are sensitive to the acid that's in the stomach. So if you take it right before you eat or with food, the acid content is the highest and that can beat up or, or sometimes even kill the good bacteria that's in that capsule. So depending on the product, sometimes we would ask somebody to take it about 20 minutes after they eat because then the food has buffered some of the acid in the stomach and the bacteria can kind of sneak by. But Properly formulated products shouldn't be as much of a problem, and that's the case with the probiotic by Healthy Origins, because those bacteria are actually engineered to be somewhat acid resistant, and so they make it through your gut no problem. And so that one you can take with or without food, whatever is convenient for you. And uh, Virginia said, "Okay, thanks." She just wondered if she needed to follow the instructions exactly, and there you go. You're welcome. Um, okay, so. How about interactions where you need more vitamin K? Well, this is going to seem like a pretty obvious one, but there are certain prescription medicines that beat up the good bacteria that's in your gut, like antibiotics, and those are classic for making it harder to maintain your vitamin K levels. Again, not to the point of having problems with clotting, but we don't recognize in medicine that needing more vitamin K for osteoporosis and for cardiovascular health, this can be a problem. And then there's certain seizure medicines like phenytoin, also known as Dilantin, or uh, phenobarbital, can also affect the um, uh, you know the vitamin K levels in the body. So um, I just want to tell you, next month 
we will be talking about brain function. That's in September. So, you know, that's already on the schedule on the website. So you can just go to the website and sign up for that now. That's a good talk that really helps not just, you know, I mean, we'll be talking about focus and concentration and memory as we age, but also we'll be talking a little bit about age-related dementia and Alzheimer's because that's becoming more and more of a concern to us as we get older. And then I also want to point out that all of our webinars are recorded and end up on our archive as well. So people can hear them 24-7. And we've probably got, I don't know, close to two dozen, two dozen of them now um, you know, in our, uh, in our archives, in our library on the website. And so all sorts of topics, including stress and weight loss and sleep and cholesterol and osteoporosis and um, reflux and um, menopause and flu and the one I mentioned about the essential six, which I think is really important. And this one as well uh, will be we'll make it onto the archive by the beginning of next week. And so if you found this information useful and you know somebody that you think could make use of it, please refer them to the website as well. Um, I really do appreciate your attention. I honor your willingness to spend some of your valuable time with me. Hopefully you found it helpful. Always looking for feedback, always willing and uh, anxious to answer your questions. So don't hesitate to contact me uh, at the office. Either email me right through the website or get the phone number off the website and give me a call. And um, also love to get feedback. So if there are topics that you want me to cover in this forum, please email them to me as well and we will add them to the queue. Everybody, I hope you have a great evening and we'll see you again real soon.